Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, um, begins one of the first of five discourses that Jesus gives inside of the Gospel of Matthew. And he's standing on the mountain here and ready to give the, this first of the five discourses. Hear the word of the Lord in Matthew 5, verse 1. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, The poor in spirit are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This is God's holy word for us today. Let's look to him in prayer and ask his blessing on our time. Lord, we are honored to be called children of God. So we humbly bow before you today, recognizing that through Christ, you did for us what we could have never, ever done for ourselves. Lord, you made a way back to you through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and we are forever grateful. We're made alive in Christ. Lord, we are your children. We're very needy, and we ask for your help today to understand what you have for us out of this Gospel of Matthew. In Christ's name, amen. So we find ourselves here in uh, the book of Matthew or in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, as I said, Jesus is uh, preparing to speak to uh, this crowd, particularly his disciples. And uh, he lays out for, for his disciples um, what it means to be a virtuous, repentant kingdom dweller. Let me try to unpack what that means. Um, earlier, before he starts this discourse, he, he tells us and echoes John's statement before Jesus in this gospel to repent because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. And so it's in the context of this idea of repent because the kingdom of God is at hand that Jesus begins to unpack all of these things. So what, what does those who are repentant sinners, what does their life look like? What is it characterized by once that repentance has happened? Once they are, are looking to be a part of the kingdom of God? What, what do they look like? And so Jesus begins to unpack this, this idea. And he does it in a form um, that would have been very common to his hearers at that time. And the form is this idea, and you heard it several times in here, blessed. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, the very first psalm or the very first psalter says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And the psalmist begins to unpack what, why is this person blessed? Why do they walk in a way that is a blessed life. And so Jesus is going to take that wisdom form and he's going to apply it to those who are repentant people that have entered the kingdom of God. And he's going to say these people are blessed. And so we have this this um, this, uh, this idea, some of you have probably heard of it, like Beatitudes. It's, Beatitudes is just a, a uh, happy name for, a uh, Latin name for blessings, um, which are common in both the Testaments. 
Um, and the word blessed refers, refers to those who are and will be happy or fortunate or to be congratulated because of God's response to their behavior or action. Now, if we, if we move through the rest of the New Testament, we know that those people are happy or blessed because God has made them alive in Him, here in Christ, and that now they are able to pursue these virtues or this behavior um, that Jesus says is characteristic of these kingdom dwellers or these future kingdom dwellers. And so he begins to unpack these ideas. And so there's... Um, Inside of here, these blessings are promises of the kingdom for those who live a repentant life. This is ongoing. This is an, an activity. It's not something that we do once and um, walk away. We live, a, we live a repentant life. And so Jesus' Jesus's hearers would have understood them especially as promises for a future time of God's reign. And the reason is because they were underneath Roman rule. There was nothing about their life that signified that they were part of a kingdom under which there was a benevolent, benevolent ruler. Jesus is saying to them, look, this is a promise to you that's, that's going to be yours moving forward. And so Jesus goes up on a mountainside similar to Moses. And as he escalates this mountainside, here we see the new lawgiver, Jesus, interpreting God's law as it's already contained in the Torah. Because all of these uh, commissions that he's given or these characteristics that he gives are things that are already contained in the Old Testament or in Torah. And so he begins to unpack these because Jesus, if you recall, he says very clearly in the Gospel of Matthew, I didn't come to discard the law or to... Um, tear it up or to push it away, I came to be the fullest manifestation of the law. The fullest comprehension of the law is going to be found in me. And so let me teach you the law in the way that it was intended, and that was to form the heart, not just form behavior. And so he begins to, to unpack these in the forms of Beatitudes. And Augustus Strong says this, a man truly repents only when he learns that a sin has made him unable to repent without the renewing grace of God. You see, if we approach life and we walk through life and we think we can contribute to um, our um, appeasement of God or our um, covering of our own sin, how can we actually repent? We have no awareness of the travesty of our own disposition before God. And so, when we look at these Beatitudes, a repentant lifestyle requires a virtuous demeanor that produces virtuous actions. You see, it's not just enough to have a mental assent that, hey, I ought to do these things, or I ought to be this kind of person. Um, there's plenty of those out there. There's plenty of those people out there. Um, usually it comes around the first of the year, right? When we make those, you know, those New Year's resolutions that, hey, I'm going to lose this amount of weight or I'm going to start exercising or I'm going to, you know, and it's a mental disposition that we say, I'm going to, and many times those do not re, uh, find themselves reflected in an action or an activity. What Jesus is saying is that your virtuous disposition these things that are characteristic of those who have been invited into the kingdom and find their self resting in the grace of God look a certain way in the community. And the community at large, the world at large, is going to respond to them also in a certain way. So what I want to do this morning is kind of un quickly unpack the, the things that Jesus says kingdom dwellers will be blessed with, they'll be characterized with, and then talk about how perhaps that finds itself inside of our own community of Clearwater Christian College. So look with me in verse 3, the very first beatitude here. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, or the poor in spirit are blessed for the kingdom of God is theirs. And so poor in spirit as a virtue um, does not talk about itself as 
poor in faith, meaning I have this small amount of faith, and please help me, Lord, with that. It's an acknowledgement of one's spiritual powerlessness and bankruptcy apart from Christ. You see, let me say that again. It's, it's the acknowledgement of one's spiritual powerlessness and bankruptcy apart from Christ. Many times we don't see ourselves that way because of pride or because of many other things inside of our life. We see ourselves as self-sustaining, particularly in the West. We see ourselves as, all I need to do is pull myself up and be my own man or be my own lady, and I can do it. And we don't see ourselves as powerless. Or we look at our own talents and we think that they're ours and that we earned them or that we, were, we worked hard enough to be given these talents and we don't recognize we're powerless apart from Christ and His work inside of our lives. And so the poor in spirit is this, this idea that we are powerless and bankruptcy apart from Christ. It's a disposition that's reflected in our attitude towards others. And so what does this poor in spirit look like? It's an attitude of self-emptying that results in a willingness to be a servant of all for the sake of the gospel. You see, poor in spirit says, I am powerless to do anything on my own, so why should I decide to do anything on my own? Why should I decide to be a business major on my own? Or why should I decide to be a biology major on my own? I should understand that my weakness is in Christ and I should rely on Him to direct my life and lay it open before Him. That's what he's asking of us here today. So to be poor in spirit requires, at some level, the virtue of humility. The humility to recognize, I don't have it all figured out, nor should I map out my entire life apart from Christ because I'm powerless to understand and have that kind of wisdom. Look at the next one with me. Verse 4 has our next beatitude. It says, Blessed, those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. What Jesus is saying here is that in light of verse 3, the probable allusion is to Isaiah 61, 2, and 3, which he talks about binding up those who are brokenhearted. Remember, Jesus walks into the temple and he reads from the scroll and he reads Isaiah 61 and he says, Today this has been fulfilled in your ears. Closes up the book and walks out and really ticks off all of the religious leaders. You see, and he say, what he's saying here is that um, blessed are those who are mourned. Mourning includes grief caused by personal sins and loss and the social evil and oppression. Now, I, I would characterize it like this. Um, what Jesus is saying is when you look out in the world and you look into yourself, do you mourn for the sin that is ever so present in your life? Or do you excuse it? Do you mourn that sin in your life? When you look out a, a, among your peers, do you mourn the sin that you see in their life? Or do you excuse it? When you look past the walls or the, the, the area of this campus and you drive off into greater Clearwater and you see things, the social ills inside of our, our city and our state, do you mourn that those types of sinful behaviors exist that oppress the innocent? And do you, do you yearn for God's kingdom to come in its fullest sense? Jesus to come back and overturn those and make those wrongs right. Do you mourn that? Do you understand what Jesus is saying is blessed are those who are mourned because they understand that sin, whether it's inside of us, inside of this campus, or inside of Clearwater proper, costs Jesus something. Do you mourn that when you walk among clear water? Do you mourn that? Jesus says, those who are kingdom dwellers mourn those things. And, but one day they'll be comforted because the king will come and right those wrongs. Whether it's a social ill of the homeless guy sitting down on the corner. Whether it's the social ill of sex trafficking. Whether it's the Clearwater Christian ill of cheating or sexual immorality. 
or improper behavior, Jesus will right those wrongs. And so he, he goes on in, um, and what does this mourning look like? Well, the question is, how do you view the sin of your own life and the world around you? And one way that we view that, according to Jesus, is mourning it, realizing that every time I sin, every time I view a sin, that was a sin that was piled on our Savior and atoned for. Do we view it that way? That's what he's calling us to inside of this passage. Look at the next one with me. Blessed are the meek, verse 5. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Meek, or the gentle um, person, is not necessarily, in this case, what we might call the wallflower, the person that just stands by and lets everything pass by them and doesn't uh, take a proactive stance towards anything. That's not what we're talking of, although sometimes we think of the meek in that way. But it's one who is humble, gentle, not aggressive. Meekness might be defined as a humble or gentle attitude towards others based on a true estimate of ourselves. You see, when, when we understand who we are in light of our sinfulness, it creates an attitude or a disposition in us that does not esteem ourselves greater than others around us because we realize, hey, I'm a sinner that's entangled in sin just like this guy. What do I have to offer Christ any more than this guy over here? And it drives us to a meek attitude that esteems others before ourselves and a sense of gentleness as we walk through our world. Inheriting the earth, as Jesus says here, is the future compensation and suggests that meekness um, sometimes is viewed also in the lack of earthly possessions in the here and now. Meaning, you know, if it, those of you who are business majors, you're going to get out in the, in the business world and you're going to realize it's a dog-eat-dog. -dog, and there's some serious ethical dilemmas that you will face in the work world that will have a direct effect on the check that you see deposited in your bank account. That is a fact. Because there's some times where you're going to have to sell out someone and make them look bad to get that promotion. You see, and what Jesus says here is, the meek, those who understand their disposition as a sinful person is, that is no better than their neighbor, that they won't do that. That they understand their place inside of the created order and they respect the image of God that was created in that person as well as their own. So Christian hope does not look forward to have inhabiting a particular country as in the Old Testament. This is the land that God has given you. But Jesus later says in his teachings, come unto me, I will give you rest. And he transfers that ownership of, of land, geography, onto himself. And he says, you're going to find the rest that I promised my Old Testament followers in me because I am the one that can give you rest. And so it's, it's this not just inheriting the land as in the Old Testament, it's inheriting the earth. The whole earth is, is the Lord's and everything in it. And so he's talking about this recreated. So what does meekness look like? The meek take criticism with humility and stand up for wrongdoing. Facing persecution with boldness. It's ironic. Meekness finds its counterpart vice in pride. So when you stand in pride, you're displaying something that Jesus says isn't in those who are in the kingdom. Look at the next one, verse 6 here with me. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. Jesus is working off of this idea of basic substance for living. Hunger and thirsting. When we hunger and thirst, we yearn for that to be filled, for that to be completed in us. And so he says, those who have repented have, a, have an attitude towards repentance. Those who have uh, been accepted into the kingdom because of their attitude of repentance will display a hunger 
and a thirst for righteousness. For the poor, righteousness would include having their basic needs met, such as food, but it goes on to include God's standards established and obeyed in every day of life. So Jesus is saying here that righteousness is just as essential for those who are repentant as food and water. That's a huge saying. That's a big teaching, what he's saying there, is that just like you and I need food and water, so should we need, hung so should we need righteousness and yearn for that in our life. So like, you know, here in about a you know, half an hour when our stomach starts growling, you know, and it says, feed me, give me food. In the same way, that's how our righteousness hunger should be when we look around us. This is not a matter of doing the right thing, but doing the right thing is an act of worship to God, for they will be filled. And so sometimes it's easy for us or better for us to think of it in terms of 2 Corinthians 5.21, what some have called the great exchange, right? That when we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we think of Jesus who made us righteous in exchange for our unrighteousness. You see, that great exchange took place and that is, is why we hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because we understand the gospel to the point that, that we understand it costs someone something for us to enjoy this yearning for righteousness that we have in our lives. It's, a, it's, it's kind of funny because most people want righteousness around them and they even desire it for themselves. Right? When you ask somebody, um, how do you want to live your life? Believer, unbeliever, it doesn't matter. When you, when you walk up to them and you say, how do you, want, how do you want people to characterize how you lived your life? Generally, they're going to respond with the golden rule. Right? They're going to say, I want people to, to think of me as a person who, who was giving and who did unto others as I expected them to do unto me. And, and they might characterize it in, in several different ways. And so, um, but here's, here's the, the, the disconnect. Those same people, as well as, as well as us in here, we're not bothered by the failure of that many times. So, so we pursue righteousness, but we don't um, repent when that righteousness doesn't happen. You see, we're not bothered by the fact that unrighteousness exists inside of our lives. Although we might mentally assent to, hey, I want to be righteous. But the counterpart of unrighteousness exists and the repentance doesn't accompany that unrighteousness in our lives. And Jesus says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are the ones who are going to be filled. So what does righteousness look like? To hunger and thirst for righteousness requires a virtue of zeal to pursue it. Meaning jealous righteousness. We might talk about zeal in terms of jealousness. You remember in the Old Testament, God says, I am jealous for you. Meaning I have a zeal for you that I want you to be my people and I want that so badly in your life that I'm going to put things inside of your life to help correct that. It's that type of virtue that, that God exhibited towards His people in the Old Testament that He's asking for us. This hunger and thirst, this zeal for righteousness. Titus 2, 11 to 14 speaks of Christ purifying us to be zealous for good works. It's that idea of being zealous, hungering, thirsting for righteousness. Look at the next beatitude with me in verse 7. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. What does it mean to be merciful? Well, merciful embraces the characteristics of being generous, forgiving others, having compassion for the suffering, providing healing of every kind, being merciful. It's interesting if you read the Old Testament, that's a basic attribute of God towards His people. Over and over and over again. He says, I am Yahweh who delivered you from Egypt. 
And that unpacks a whole constellation of thoughts and emotions for the Israelite people that my grandfather, my great-great-great-grandfather stood in slavery with whips on his back or her back and God delivered them from that and it's for that reason that I enjoy this life today. And God continually reminded his people, I showed mercy to you. Texts such as Exodus 34 reminds us of that, that he shows mercy to his people. So, uh, Beatitudes like the Beatitudes we've talked about up to this point, Beatitudes 1 through 4 echo the tenor of Micah 5.8 and many of you know that. What does the Lord require of you? Right? He says, what, what does the Lord require of you? To what? Somebody say it. What does it say? Can't hear you. Somebody know it? Okay. Did everybody hear that? Say it really loud. Okay, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly before your God. You see, the first four attributes or the first four beatitudes or characteristics of kingdom dwellers are summarized in the Old Testament. Jesus is not giving them anything new. He's showing them the fullest expression or the flowering expression of all the things that God's people have been taught throughout history. And he's showing that it is fulfilled in the gospel. It's fulfilled. You have the power to do this through me. Jesus gave an example later on in Matthew's gospel in Matthew 18, 23 to 35 when he talks about the wicked servant. You remember that, that story where he tells about um, the servant has his debt. There's no way they can ever repay it. He comes and he falls at the master's feet um, and begs for mercy and the master lets him go. And then he goes out and finds this other person that owes him virtually nothing. And he demands payment and throws him in jail. And Jesus says that, uh, that, that Lord says, you wicked servant, how dare you try to collect from this person when I've forgiven you of so much, when I've shown you this amount of mercy. So what does mercy look like? It, re it reflects the, gener the virtue of generosity and forgiveness. Generosity requires giving without exception. Forgiveness understands that sins against understands the sins against us in light of our sins against the most holy God. We then forgive others as God has forgiven us. You see, many times in our life we're holding things in against someone else and there's some pretty atrocious offenses against people in this room. I recognize that you've brought that. That's baggage that you've brought to this campus. But many times we should see that. We should see that extension of forgiveness in light of what we've been forgiven of. And not just in light of the circumstance that we find ourselves in. And extend forgiveness because that's where that healing starts because we recognize the extent of the gospel. That if the offense against me in this particular situation, which is horrendously great, can be forgiven by me, then how much more did my Christ forgive me of all of the offenses against him and so mercy look with me in verse 8 at the next beatitude the pure in heart are blessed for they will see God inside of this particular beatitude purity of heart refers to moral unright, uh, uprightness not just ritual cleanness so as the righteous in general for Matthew Jesus requires his disciples to bear witness to a lifestyle that's pleasing to God. The pure in heart exhibit a single-minded devotion to God that stems from an internal cleaning created by following Jesus. You know, in, in the Old Testament, David, in Psalm 51, after that horrific failure with Bathsheba, Ask God, create in me a clean heart. And so, you know, a lot of times we read this beatitude and we're like, well, how does that happen? Well, if we read scripture, it tells us that. Create in me a clean heart. How does that happen? Well, it happens through the power of the gospel. And then after we come to Christ, we recognize our need for Christ, we confess, we repent. Then that continual cleaning comes through the washing of the word, reading the word, hearing what God has for us. And so we feed and strengthen our heart 
and longing for purity by, by immersing ourselves in the scriptures and asking the Spirit to form us as we read those scriptures. You see, the, the, the pure in heart is really a virtue of faith, that we believe that the scriptures are sufficient for life. And we read them every day, we dwell on them, we meditate on them, and we obey them. That's what all of Psalm 119 is about. Psalm 119 tells us, look to the scriptures because they are the wisdom of life. They should be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Michael Austin describes this faith as a human response of entrustment to one, of oneself to God and God's promises. So those who are pure in heart, they're exhibiting this virtue of faith. The next one in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. As with merciful in verse 7, peacemakers focus on interpersonal relationships. You have to have someone to make peace with before you can be a peacemaker. You know, you can't be a monk on a mountainside living in a shack by yourself and say, hey, you know, I've got peace with the two by four over here, right? So you, you, have, to, you have to have someone, it happens in community. So peacemakers is interpersonal relationships, this idea of shalom from the Old Testament finds its way into the Beatitudes where Jesus is saying, be a peacemaker, be a person who pursues a life of shalom, wholeness and harmony rather than strife and discord in all aspects of life. Those who reconcile others to God and to each other are called sons of God here. And we should always be aware that God made peace with us first and thereby it enables us to make peace with others and to make peace with God through the gospel. So what does this look like? Peacemaking reflects a life of peace brought through Christ's peacemaking on our behalf. We strive to live peaceably and bring peace to others in light of Christ's peace with us. It's a perspective. We view Christ's peace that he brought to us every day when we are faced with conflict and, and we should recognize the peace that exists there is for that. So then we finally end with blessed are those who are persecuted. I'm just going to say this about um, those who are persecuted and that is when you pursue these beatitudes people around you aren't going to like it because it sheds light on their sinful behavior. So let me finish with this. Are you pursuing the Beatitudes on this campus? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness enough to be zealous and courageous enough to confront your classmates when you see them cheating and lying about academic work? What kind of academic distinction would we have here at Clearwater if the students self-governed academic impropriety such as cheating, plagiarism, lying about academic tasks. What kind of campus, what kind of community would we have? You may say, that's impossible. In fact, it isn't. You see, many of the campuses of the previous century had an honor code. And the honor code would kind of go like this. This guy over here is cheating. Start tapping my pencil. That's a, recogni that's a recognition to this guy that he knows somebody is seeing him cheat. Then another person looks around. He's seeing him cheat. You see, you've just self-governed that room. You've just said, I will not stand for you lowering the academic integrity inside of this room because you are diminishing my community by doing it. That's what it means to be a mentoring community. That's what it means to value the gospel over our pride. That's what it means to stand up and be courageous in the face of sin. That's what we're called to do, and we will be persecuted for it, whether it's on this campus or in Clearwater. Another is academic laziness. We could go on and on, 
But if we desire to be a mentoring community, that's what we're called to do, whether it's senior to freshman, faculty to student, whatever it is. And so you may say that's impossible, but Jesus says to pursue these beatitudes, they're doing it as children of the King. So does your life reflect beatitude virtues? If not, good news, the gospel is for you and me. That's what we're called to. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. C.H. Spurgeon said this, and we'll finish. You're not living to God as you ought unless you repent daily. I urge you and me and all of us in here, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's pray together. Lord, guide our thoughts and our actions. Holy Spirit, speak to us as we read your word and as others confront us. Help us to be meek. Lord, take our pride away. Take our strife away. Take away all those things that get in the way of a life that proclaims you are king. Help us. We need it today, Christ Jesus. Amen.